So welcome back, everybody, to the conference. And um, I'm Iman Ramoni Rousseau. I'm the, the, the Director General for uh, Market Operations here at DCB. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our market participant panel today, because one of the principles of the conference is to have this dialogue between the academic uh, uh, literature uh, and uh, uh, market participants' uh, view on monetary policy implementation and money markets. So today we're very fortunate to have four panelists that are accomplished financial market professionals and are uniquely suited to provide a 360 degree uh, perspective on the issue of central bank operational uh, frameworks. And we have a really good representation of different parts of the financial system. So we have two uh, internationally active banks, a US bank, a Euro area bank. We have an asset, large asset manager, and a hedge fund. Um, so with that, let me introduce briefly the panelists, uh, starting with Seth Carpenter. So Seth, you are uh, uh, the global chief economist for Morgan Stanley, and you had roles before at UBS and Rocco's Capital. But before that, you had a distinguished career as a central banker, um, 15 years at the Federal Reserve, eventually as deputy director of the Division of Monetary Affairs. Uh, and then you transitioned to the US Treasury as deputy assistant secretary for macroeconomic analysis and then uh, assistant secretary for financial markets. Um, Arancha, Arancha Cano, uh, you are a portfolio uh, manager at Wellington Asset Management. And prior to that, you also had a very rich career as portfolio manager um, in hedge funds, so Baliesni Asset Management, more capital management, and before that at UBS on the prop trading um, side. Yeah. Um, so Louis, uh, Louis Arrault, uh, you are, I think uh, people know you well here, you are the CV watcher uh, for Credit uh, Agricole, and um, you are renewed for your sharp monitoring of our monetary policy decisions and your insightful and witty reports uh, on the ramifications of these decisions on uh, money markets. And finally, Giuseppe Marafino. Giuseppe, uh, you are currently the Euro Area Rate Strategist and Head of Research at LMR Partners, a hedge fund. And formerly, you worked at Barclays and Unicredit. And your career has always been linked to uh, money markets and, uh, and research. So let's, let's uh, start. And um, since the global financial crisis, uh, central banks' balance sheets have changed significantly in terms of size and composition. And they re reacted to two main trends that Philip Lane outlined uh, this morning, which is basically uh, the fact that central banks did QE to react to uh, below target inflation. And they also reacted to market disruptions that were threatening the transmission of monetary policy. And at the same time, as these central bank balance sheets were expanding, other structural changes were taking place in financial markets and profoundly changing and transforming financial markets. A new regulatory regime was put in place. Uh, banks have also, uh, as a result, uh, and as a result of the crisis, uh, altered uh, their risk attitude and their risk management. The role of non-banks has become more prominent, as the last session has uh, shown. And finally, technology has accelerated the speed of financial transactions with possible digital runs, as we saw in March, and uh, giving rise to um, financial tensions. And so overall, the experience from the pre-great financial crisis may have become less informative, yeah? And so the first question, and let's kick off with you, Seth, is from a macro perspective, I mean, can you elaborate on <coughs> the structural change uh, since the great financial crisis that you consider most relevant for banks, demand for reserves, and central bank frameworks? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Iman. And it is an absolute pleasure for me to be here. I remember coming to very early versions of this conference, and it's always been fantastic. And being with really smart colleagues is, is fantastic. So <coughs> a lot has changed since the financial crisis. Um, I think all the points that you made about regulation, about risk controls within banks, all of those on a micro level are absolutely critical to the way the market is functioning. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of reaction function from central banks and then just general 
uh, macro and market developments that have affected the way banks are, are acting in, in money markets. And one of the way that I like to talk about this is we have had a number of so-called once in a lifetime events, but it feels like we've had about four or five in the past 20 years. Uh, and I don't think that is uh, much of an exaggeration. So the financial crisis was clearly a, a huge event. I think the freezing of the repo market in September 2019 was a massive event that had the, the, the possibility of shaking uh, markets globally. COVID was obviously a, a huge shock to the world. March 20th uh, uh, development in, in treasury markets uh, was a big event tied to COVID for sure, but sort of its own idiosyncratic once in a lifetime event, the LDI crisis in, in the UK. Uh, so why do I stress that part of things from a macro perspective? I think it has shaped both policy response and mentality for firms. Um, policy response in, in terms of regulation, I still think there's a, a move among banks to try to figure out, in financial markets overall, to understand how different regulations are going to be binding. Uh, that's not fully understood. Um, there is the risk management by individual firms. If there's a line from regulators, you don't want to go right up to the line right away. You want to stay back from the line. But then when you overlay those considerations with the fact that we have seen these massive dislocations in markets, that can mean big losses for firms or for hedge funds, potentially big opportunities uh, that often get intermediated through dealers. Um, I think that... Uh, change in view of the world about how big the shocks could be is really important. I do worry uh, that <clears throat> with these once in a lifetime shocks, when people do postmortems about the reaction function of central banks to these big shocks, very often you hear things like, well, we can't worry about uh, moral hazard in the moment. We have to keep the world from stopping turning. And it was mm. such a big ca catastrophe. Moral hazard is an issue. I think it's worth testing that question because we've, 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 we've seen so many of these big events. So how does that matter for monetary policy operating frameworks, for money markets, and for reserves? I think part of it is the reaction uh, has been, and now several times in a row, massive, overwhelming size in central bank responses in terms of flooding the market with liquidity to try to uh, mm -hmm. prevent the worst possible outcomes. <clears throat> we clearly saw that uh, in 2000. Uh, well, we saw that in 2009, I guess, when we first started doing QE1 at the Fed. Over time, those programs, those LSAT programs, actually got bigger and bigger until we got to the open-ended LSAT program. And I think that was sort of part of this evolution towards bigger and bigger size. Uh, when we got to September 2019, repo markets froze up. The Fed came in with massive purchases of treasury bills, very, very large, uh, that I think I remember a couple days before the intervention by the Fed, I had clients calling me and saying, things are getting bad. How soon before the Fed's going to come in and intervene? Uh, March 2020, we saw a freezing in the Treasury market, big intervention by the Fed, started a very, very large QE program that then went on for an extraordinarily long period of time, all the while arguing it was both macroeconomic policy and financial stability. Um, and so I, I, I do think the fact that people are still grappling with the idea that we have, we're in a world with bigger shocks, uh, what the reaction function needs to be from policymakers, how banks should re respond, uh, I really do think we've got a skew in the reaction, and that's a big part of how we ended up where we are. And, and I think it's a fun it, it changes uh, where markets are. And so the last point is, between the financial crisis and, and, and sort of the first tentative liftoff and definitely th this, this last hiking cycle, uh, everyone in markets got very, very comfortable with the idea that cash, liquidity, had essentially zero cost, or in some cases, negative cost. And business models were built around that fact. Uh, we're in a different world right now, and I think that's another aspect that we need to grapple with. No, thanks. thanks very much. And um, Arancia, uh, Luis, and Giuseppe, in, in one sentence, if you can characterize the structural change that you would focus on. For me, it's very clear. I mean, banks used to absorb cycles, basically. They were the shock absorbers, you know, over time because of the way they accounted for MPLs and provisions. Regulation has just made the banks extremely procyclical. And even more <coughs> procyclical when people like me, an investor, um, will straight away, you know, understand that the ROEs they can produce are going to be diminished and basically 
threaten if you want, you know, in a downturn of the cycle. That creates that reaction function where the banks, you know, react to those low valuations and protect themselves, whether it's from capital and increased liquidity. So you should think of banks as the instruments that would accelerate probably a downturn rather than help that downturn. Yeah, on my side, I totally agree with, uh, with what you both said. Uh, I think that today the bank treasurer is totally scared. I mean, in 2007, his job was to make money uh, with his cash, his liquidity. And today, the only thing he thinks about is to have enough cash tomorrow, whatever happens, due mm. to the, the once in a lifetime uh, event that, uh, that happened since 2008. <coughs> and that's why you have no longer uh, the possibility for banks to lend to someone that is not absolutely safe, that is to, say, to lend to, uh, to the ECB, basically. Yes, thanks. No, just, uh, just to mention that uh, my remarks today are reflecting my own view and not the funds I work for. So coming to your question, in my opinion, the most important change over the past year is related to the, the fact that the dealers' uh, bank balance sheet has become a scarce commodity. No. So there is a, a cost for using banks' balance sheet. And investors before the crisis didn't know that, didn't pay anything, was free. And uh, this has enormous impact on the plumbing and the, the intermediation of both in the liquidity market and the cash market. That makes uh, the system much more vulnerable or sensitive to shocks. And uh, the effort of banks uh, over the past few years has been uh, to make the, system, the, um, the, the user of balance sheet more efficient through the user of netting or the user of CCPs. But uh, overall, I would say the presence of the, of the central banks to provide backstop has become even more important. In this context. I may just add to the plumbing point, which yeah. I fully agree with. The sheer volume of sovereign paper in the market that has to be either financed or held or purchased by someone is much, 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 much larger given the size of everyone's balance sheet. And I think that adds an extra wrinkle to the plumbing. We're trying to put yeah. more paper through the same pipes. Correct. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, so that's a nice segue also to one of the major structural change uh, that we're going to zoom into. And that's basically um, the changes in uh, banks regulation. Okay, mm -hmm. B Because it comes in various forms in your intervention, but let, let's zoom in there and let's focus on you know, uh, the, the different ratios that have been either introduced or, um, or transformed as a result of the uh, post-GFC, the liquidity coverage ratio, uh, the leverage ratio, and the net stable <coughs> funding ratio. And uh, clearly, the way in which banks today are steering these ratios, yeah, my feeling is that this interacts in various dimensions with the way that they determine their demand for reserves, yeah? And we don't fully understand how this interaction actually works, but let's try to understand a bit better. So, um, Arantxa, from your investment perspective, which, are, which of these three regulatory ratios that I mentioned, or maybe another one, represent the most binding constraint uh, for, you know, demand for reserves and central bank frameworks and why? So, so for the market operations, by far LCR is the one you should focus on. Um, it's a ratio that hasn't matter because there's been excess reserves, you know, um, but it's a ratio that we're all focusing the most. Above all, because of the final repayment of TLTRO. I mean, <coughs> the LCR ratio, most treasurers and my colleagues probably will comment on that. There's two ways to address that ratio. It's either the numerator or the denominator. The first starting point is that when you ask treasurers, where do you think your LCR is going to go post-TLTRO, there is no agreement. There are people who think 120% is the right number, people who think it's 130%, 140%. So that creates a lot of instability in the market. Because if there is no agreement, what is a good, safe ratio? By definition, banks will create buffers on buffers. So if you have to manage your LCR, so you repay your TLTRO, the collateral that comes back is probably the least worst collateral, the least good collateral because the rest is already back. So you have two things. Either you beat up for funding, and then you know the better banks have basically the possibility to issue cover bonds. But remember, in the Eurozone, banks' balance sheet have been contracted for the last 10 years. So not everyone has available collateral to basically create cover bonds, problem number one. The second thing is if you say, well, I manage my denominator, you can do two things. You can bid up for the highest quality liabilities. Yeah. So that means paying up for deposits. 
or basically you can't reduce the balance sheet of the bank. That means contraction in the economy. So when you think as a central bank, what is the reaction function of banks, you need to consider both. The first one that I said, paying up for high quality liabilities, so payroll accounts, will change deposit beta models. And for that, you need to think about you know, financial instability, because if the banks model wrongly their deposit betas, it will have an implication. The second one is contraction to the economy, because the banks will say it's not worthwhile <coughs> to keep on paying for funding, therefore, it pays me off to lend less to the economy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this question, I think, of deposit betas for the denominator is extremely important. So, Giuseppe, f from your window in the <coughs> quote unquote fast money community, I mean, how do you see financial regulation affecting banks' uh, demand for reserves? Absolutely, I totally agree with Arancia. Is the liquidity cover ratio is the most important requirement for, uh, for banks in terms of demand for reserve. We need, we need also to consider the, that in addition to LCR, we have the internal, internal model, liquidity money for banks, that many times are stricter than LCR. And then also demand by, or reserves of eligible collateral for the intraday payment system. Sometimes banks need the reserve collateral to collateralize their inter any intraday volume or, or lending in the, in the target to payment. So, but let's focus on LCR, because in my opinion, what's happening in March is very important. We can have several lessons from them. The first one is the importance of the liquidity regulation. Regional, US regional banks didn't have a liquidity requirement. So the liquidity requirement is important to inject the discipline in the banks how to manage the liquidity buffer. But at the same time, Credit Suisse with a very good uh, liquidity cover ratio had a problem. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this means that the ratio has some weakness, I would say. And first of all, we talk about a 30 days stress period. In reality, it's a one day stress period. Bank run could start overnight or during the weekend. And the, bank, and the, the queue in front of the branch is just the last part of the bank run. Mm -hmm. So at this, it means that we need to look at the Saturday what how banks measure the, they estimate the net outflow, so the denominator. Retail deposits, they have a very low or zero bank runoff rate, but a, a deposit from young people yeah. are different from deposits from, I would say, old people. The former are la much less stable than the latter, maybe more similar to money market fund deposits. When we, took, we need to consider the amount of oper non-operational liquidity, non-insured deposits, or the amount of deposits in different currencies, the currency breakdown or the liquidity coverage. So many, many aspects that before nobody considered, but now we need to consider. And I think banks have started already to pay a lot of attention to that. They want also to show to the market that they are cautious. So when they calculate the net, net outflow, probably they have apply stricter runoff rate, and they want to have an HQLA were much larger than the denominator. And actually, the numerator, this is very important because this gives us an indication of the demand for reserves. This model was a very interesting chart in the uh, Philip Lane presentation. It showed that yeah, the so ratio between uh, HQLA, uh, yeah. reserves Reserve over HQLA. HQLA. Yeah. It was 50% in April 2020, basically before the, we say, the big increase in the, in the balance sheet before the pandemic, and now it's 70%. So what will be the optimal ratio? Arancia say that nobody <laughs> answered this question. No? no, but I was thinking, you know, what I was saying, one thing I should warn you about, I'm good at warning people around <laughs> in the audience, so, so watch out. Um, you know, I mean, see what happened in Belgium the other day, you know? It's like they miscalculated how much money they could get, basically, from retail in a, in a retail offering. So the offering from the Belgian government was equivalent to a 7% outflow of deposit in one day. When you calculate LCR, it's a 5% deposit outflow in a month. So if you're a bank treasurer, you need to think, what if you have external shocks of this type? I mean, obviously, you're going to run buffers on yes. buffers. So that is why they don't have a number they want to run by. And also another important point, reserves and government bonds are both a level one asset. Mm the best asset for HQA, yeah. but they are not the perfect substitute. This is very important. Banks prefer reserves. First of all, <laughs> it's a safe asset. It's a central bank. It's a good remuneration, the repo rate. Government bonds, even the safest are bonds or treasury, they, are, uh, they suffer the market volatility. 
Banks have also some cost, the cost of aging, and also remember the margin as part of the calculator the denominator. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you, in case of stress, you need to go to the market to repo the treasury or to sell them. But even selling is not easy because the accounting could create a problem is at HTM. You need to go to the central banks. It's a repo operation in the central banks is fine theoretically, but I'm not sure that investor and market is happy to see the MRO usage increase by 100 billion in one week. So we need to consider, for this reason, probably banks have a skewer towards having more reserves than bonds. And with the, liquidity, the, the denominator, the liquidity cover ratio now at the 3 trillion, let's assume we have 130% liquidity cover ratio, the numerator will be 3.9 trillion. 50% mm. reserves means about 2 trillion at least of reserves, reserves. that the banks could require, request. Yeah. In, in, this, in the new normal, we'll say. So it's incredible because before the great financial crisis, we had no liquidity ratio at all. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying the liquidity ratio we have is not, uh, you know, uh, I know we're not conservative enough and you can have stress scenarios that are much more severe than in this ratio. So I don't know where we stop on that, but uh, maybe to wrap up on this, on this uh, uh, regulation point, um, Louis or Seth, would you like to add anything there, regulation. Yeah, no, just a quick point. I'm obviously not a regulation expert, uh, but what is interesting is that I had the feeling between, say, 2016 and 2019 that the ratio that mattered, especially maybe for my bank, that's why, but uh, was the NSF ratio because banks... So net stable funding. Net ratio. stable funding ratio, indeed, because banks needed term funding and that was the complicated part, apparently, to fund, uh, especially from the market, due to the fact that uh, insurers and uh, asset managers were not uh, were reluctant to fund banks uh, on term funding. And that's why, probably, uh, the ECB, the euro system, implemented TLTR2, and more importantly, the first part of TLTR3 that were clearly uh, to support banks NSFR. What we have to say currently is that despite the repayment of TLTR2 and the shortening of their maturity, they are, most of them are no longer eligible to, to NSFR, banks have achieved to fill their NSFR ratio without too much difficulty, and no, indeed, I totally agree with my two co-panelists, uh, the focus is clearly on liquidity coverage ratio, and mm. the uh, worry in, in banks is more on that point. I think the only extra thing I would add, sitting through some of the earlier uh, panels, I remember trying to come up with models, theoretical models of demand for reserves and how that would interact with supply and what is it that drives a bank's demand for reserves. I think the regulatory side of things is clearly important. Uh, two of our panelists said uh, LCR clearly important. Third said uh, NSFR is very important. Imen, you mentioned at the beginning the uh, leverage ratio. I think the fact that there are different sets of requirements that could be binding for different banks yeah. at any point in time, or different regulations could be binding for the same bank at different points in time. I think therein lies for me one of the very, very challenging aspects of trying to model any of these in very simple, tractable, uh, continuously differentiable models. Absolutely. So let's now transition to another uh, profound change of the past 15 years. And that's the changes in market <coughs> functioning and market structures, yeah? So the functioning of money markets in particular is key for central bank uh, operational frameworks. And they are the main channel um, for redistributing liquidity across the banking system and also between banks and non-banks. Uh, and these markets have also experienced really structural changes since the financial crisis. I'll only mention two, and I'm sure you will have many others to mention in the discussion. The first one is a move towards more secured funding markets as the prime channel for redistributing liquidity, so repo markets in focus here while activity in the unsecured interbank market has remained very muted, yeah, very marginal since the crisis. And the second uh, transformational change is the increasing role of CCP, central counterparties, and in particular in money markets in relation also um, uh, to uh, basically uh, regulation, I mean, other streams of uh, post-crisis uh, regulatory reform. And lastly, of course, the role of non-banks uh, in the money markets. So, um, Louis, when you look at uh, money markets uh, today, uh, how do you see you know, all these changes playing out? So when do you think that, and that's an important question for us as central bankers when we uh, look at our operational frameworks, do you think that the interbank market can recover as excess liquidity is reduced? 
would there be you know, a sufficient set of incentives there for banks to start trading again uh, in the interbank market with each other? Um, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, I would say no. I don't think that uh, the interbank <laughs> market can revive at some point in time. I mean, today, what I said at the beginning is that I have the feeling that the bank treasurer is totally scared and he's way too scared to lend to another bank. That this part also on the fact that the regulation make very costly for a French bank, for example, to lend overnight unsecured uh, to uh, an Italian bank. So we, it will be extremely costly, I think, for uh, it's too risky uh, for for banks to lend to another in in unsecured. So that's why I think that we we will struggle to see a revival of the of the unsecured bank market. That's the first point. The second point is that indeed there's still an unse uh, uncertainty because currently there's no need for an unsecured interbank market because almost no banks need overnight liquidity uh, currently mm. uh, by the simple fact that we are still largely in excess liquidity, <coughs> even in the in the I would say weakest uh, jurisdiction. So there's no need for the interbank market currently. Now the question is whether we will see again a revival of the, of the unsecured interbank market. I think that we have a natural experiment uh, when the ECB implemented the tiering uh, in October 2019. When the ECB yeah. implemented the tiering in October 2019, it meant that the Italian banks were short of liquidity. Italian banks as a jurisdiction were short of liquidity to fill the tiered facility. And so they had to borrow cash overnight to someone else. And uh, so, and what happened is that they did not borrow uh, to other banks. They increased their, their rate of, um, of borrowing uh, toward uh, money market. And so the interbank market did not revive due to this need of lending across banks, but it went through uh, non-bank uh, actors, especially uh, money market fund. So my answer would be that I don't expect the interbank and secured market to revive, but I think that there's a way to, counter, to, uh, to contour this, uh, this situation via a non-bank actor, namely uh, money market fund especially. Yeah, uh, and clearly also last session showed that, you know, the importance of non-banks and the role they play in relation to banks is an important uh, dimension. So Giuseppe, how do you assess um, the functioning of the different segments of money markets today? Absolutely. First of all, let me say I totally agree with uh, we interbank and secure market is uh, that is very unlikely to recover uh, soon. Also because there is a regulatory imp important aspect to consider the lending over tight to another bank as a RWA cost. So the rate, if applied, will be very, very high, much higher than the debt rate. On the other side, uh, a borrowing unsecured has a 100% runoff rate for the liquidity cover ratio. So much better, and this is, is working very well, unsecured interbank secured market. So repo between banks. This is very, especially if uh, versus uh, high quality collateral, so government bonds, that has a runoff rate for the liquidity cover ratio very, very low. And this is actually working very well. Banks are lending each other in the repo market and uh, also lending between banks and non-banks. Banks are using a lot of netting, both via CCP or asking in exchange for specific bonds, special bonds, T-bills, for example. So you have uh, bonds, security versus securities. So this does not absorb balance sheet. Remember what we said in the beginning, you know, there is now balance sheet is a, a scarce commodity. And this, of course, favor a, a lot of the intermediation. What we have seen uh, on the, the, since the beginning of this year, ahead of the payment of the TLTRO, many banks, especially Italian banks, have done a long-term repo, 12 months repo, for example, a, using the BTPs or other bonds they use as collateral. And uh, so this is a sign that the market is functioning, but the long-term repo is good also for nestable fund duration. Another important segment, uh, uh, so and indeed, CCPs are a very important role in this context mm. because they favor netting. So the dealers, they can net repo, reverse repo transaction. This very save a lot of save balance sheet. They also allow them to apply good conditions to the trade in terms of haircut and the rate applied to the, to the repo transaction. In my opinion, an important segment that has to be developed is the unsecured market. Secure market in wholesale money market, so commercial paper, which is basically between banks and non-banks. Already we, since the beginning of the year, we have seen an increase in the CP volume. Many banks have started to issue six months, 12 months in, uh, to replace the tier tier and the outstanding has increased. And uh, this is important because uh, there is no absorption of collateral. So mm -hmm. part of the banks can get funding without uh, blocking, blocking part of the asset side. So this is very important. And also provide, uh, reduce uh, uh, any potential uh, scarce depression in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the repo market. 
Of course, we need to work a lot on the CP market because there is still some fragmentation among mm. countries. We yeah. have the French CP market, Italian CP market, German CP market, European commercial paper market. It's on rules, on uh, legal aspect. There was um, a lot of development, especially in France, with neo CP program or STEP program by the CP that favor a lot, but we need to work about it more to have. Also in the secondary market, to have a more efficient secondary market that allow many investors, especially money market funds, <coughs> to, to invest. So overall, in actual, it, money market is uh, doing well, especially secure market. Mm. Unfortunately, interbank market, unsecure interbank market is unlikely to recover soon. No, absolutely. And, and just to come back, to, you mentioned uh, that uh, CCPs were important, central clearing. And I think this is, you know, in Europe, uh, we are, I think, quite fortunate to have a well-functioning, um, cleared repo market. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the percentage of transactions that are cleared, centrally cleared for repo is very high. Yeah? It's around the 70 to 80 percent. In the US, it's still a live conversation. Yes. You know, how do you, uh, you know, put central clearing into the picture uh, for repo markets and government bond markets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, continuing the conversation about um, adaptation in, in market structure and, and market functioning, I really cannot um, resist questioning a little bit the, the pre the premise that you all, um, I think, uh, gave so far, which is, you know, there's no going back to the pre-GFC uh, uh, <coughs> world, okay? Um, because, you know, it's easy to say that, but to some extent, um, banks will have uh, to adapt to uh, basically lower reserves, yeah? And so uh, I have the feeling that today we have in mind, again, the, you know, this uh, uh, way of thinking about um, hysteresis for banks, that banks, you know, have been used to such large amounts uh, of excess liquidity uh, that basically uh, they will not be able uh, to adapt to a different uh, regime, yeah? Uh, but Seth, I mean, in your view, how strong are, in fact, these hysteresis effects because you you started uh, saying well uh, they will have you know to 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 do things differently than before and you said also maybe central banks have created expectations that now they have to you know uh, scale back a little bit and so how could a smooth um, without hysteresis transition uh, towards a, a, an environment with lower reserves uh, but still sufficient reserves be engineered Absolutely. So uh, hysteresis is a great word. And so I think one of the challenges, <clears throat> this is like the econometric challenge of trying to estimate whether a process has a unit root to it or just has a very long memory process. And I think in practice, there's not a lot of difference when we're talking about sort of things that are going on in markets over the course of a few months to, to, to a couple of quarters. Uh, and by that, what I mean is we heard uh, Arancha and I, I think Giuseppe talking about how banks are reacting to current circumstances by not just meeting the regulations, but having buffers on top of buffers on top of buffers. Uh, <clears throat> liquidity plans, risk management is absolutely categorically a very important uh, topic everywhere in financial markets. Uh, so important, in fact, that a liquidity plan, how the asset side of the balance sheet is structured, is not something that is just done simply by the treasurer of the bank and then forgotten. It's discussed by the treasurer, who then talks to the CFO, who then talks to the CEO, and they jointly talk to the board. Mm. Those sorts of plans are very challenging to change at a dime. And so when I think about you know, a, a, a theoretical version of how this might work, you would see spreads start to open up. Uh, and then there'd be a no arbitrage condition that would happen. And is, if the spread got to be more than a couple of basis points, the bank's going to step in and take advantage of that. It's just not the way the world is going to work anytime soon. And so what you would have to see potentially is a very large spread that opens up and not just for a day or for a weekend, but for months and months and months and perhaps quarters at a time to the point where someone on a treasurer desk can write a memo to the treasurer that says, if we change what we're doing, we can pick up 15 basis points, and it looks like we'll have the same ultimate uh, 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 return. And the, the treasurer will look at that and go, <clears throat> well, you know, around November is when bonuses are determined, so let's come back to this topic uh, <laughs> early next year, uh, just in case something goes wrong. Right? And, and then eventually it'll get socialized all the way up. Uh, and, and, 
and so is that, a, is that a permanent shift in things? Is that truly hysteresis, or is it just a very, very long-lived process? I'm not sure I know exactly the difference. I suspect that if we saw large market deviations for a long enough period of time, you would get a change in banks' funding plans and banks' liquidity plans. But it would have to be big, and it would have to be persistent. Persistent. We often look at the spreads and go, wow, you, know, you had 15 basis points, 20 basis points, isn't that a lot? You know, uh, hedge funds will often chase 15 or 20 basis points uh, uh, in, a, in a various trade. But for money markets, yeah, we have to remember, at least in the US, the convention is to take whatever that spread is, and then you divide it by 360. And then you think about what portion of that might go into your own comp at the end of the year, and then ask yourself, am I certain, 100% certain that's going to be right against the possibility that my career is now over? Uh, because I took the wrong decision. And I think therein lies some of the real life frictions here and why some of these spreads can be large and extraordinarily persistent. Yeah, Aaron Shah. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think there is a lot of inertia of, you know, just protecting yourself, especially. I mean, banks face people like me, you know, it's like when you trade at four and five times book value, your only hope is to become so safe that you create enough buffers that you can convince me you're a safe bank and therefore, you know, eventually the valuation will work, you know. But there is a lot of self-protection that, as I said, it takes time basically to work it out, you know. I don't think the treasurers are going to change their reaction function very easily. Yeah, and it's about this asymmetry, yeah, <clears throat> that basically you know, the spread, uh, uh, exploiting the spread doesn't get you very much, but if you get it wrong, then the consequences are much more severe. Yeah. I mean, you could see what happened in February with the event of the US banks, basically the regional banks. When you see the performance of the different subsectors in Europe, it was the weakest link that got impacted more, you know? The share prices of the banks that have the lowest operating profits, the lowest ROE, are the ones that get impacted the most. So guess what the treasuries of those banks were doing? Just hovering liquidity, basically. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so a transition that is likely to take some time and, and require, as you said, also changes in mindset, uh, changes potentially in governance and a bit more flexibility in uh, the governance of banks than, than we have today, yeah? So, I mean, uh, another change of the past uh, 15 years years, uh, of course, was the extensive use of uh, large-scale asset purchases and uh, longer-term lending operations. And these have been really additions uh, from the ECB perspective, but also other central banks to, to the central bank toolkit uh, that have really transformed this toolkit. Yeah? Uh, and, and now we're entering a different, uh, a different phase. Yeah? I mean, as you mentioned, the Arantxa TLTROs are being um, largely repaid. Purchase programs have started or are well entrained to, to run off. And so um, I think a fair question is how could the role of these instruments, so asset purchases on one side, longer term lending operations on the other side, be adjusted to a new steady state? Yeah, and, and Philip Lane said a little bit about you know, this this morning with this idea of a hybrid you know, uh, system where you combine uh, asset purchases, longer term lending operations and the uh, short term lending operations. And so um, if we start with you, Arantxa, I mean, starting from uh, your perspective, uh, you have the euro area, which is a bank based uh, economy. And so how do you expect um, basically banks need <coughs> for central bank operations in, in the future, yeah? So what could be, for example, the attractiveness for banks of longer term uh, lending operations uh, if they are not subsidized like they were for TLT euros during the pandemic? And how do you see also asset purchases being part of uh, not QE, but more of providing reserves uh, for banks? Yeah, I think, I think lending operations is a lot easier because basically, as I said, there's a lot of externalities that are going to impact, you know, liquidity for the banks. I mentioned what happened in Belgium or Italy. And we can discuss, obviously, minimum reserve requirements, you know. I mean, all those changes are crowding out, basically, profitability of the banks. You know, it's a tax on the system, you know, and how they react to it is going to be different. Where the lending operations come from is like, if you have a facility that, first of all, is, you know, seen as non-stigma, 
that will help a lot. The first problem that we have is any facility that it has a superior cost, so too high cost, too short tenor, and too strict collateral, it's basically seen as stigma. And basically, only banks that really, really need that funding because they cannot get it anywhere else will come to use that facility. Now, the minute that any of us knows that those banks are using their facility is the minute those banks lose their credibility. So it's a, it's a virtual circle. It's like, what kind of parameters do you fix in the facility so that, you know, like very strong banks and weaker banks all use the facility. Now, of course, you know, the, the, the Christmas list of the treasurers is a facility like the, P, you know, the BTFP in the US, you know, which is ample liquidity, tenor, no you know, haircut. no oh, haircuts, you know, as I said. <laughs> I mean, I said to them that was the Christmas list, you know, you write 20 <laughs> things and you get three, but, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you should try to think about something that has the least stigma possible, you know, and I think that would be the most valuable thing for, for the system, you know, to engage into more routine, you know, operations with the central bank to be part of the funding, basically, which I don't think the MRO is today, no? I guess on purchases, they used to be very relevant in the past because they avoided fragmentation, but that was when there was a very strong linkage between the sovereign, basically, and the banks through the ALCO portfolios. I mean, as we said, you know, reserves is 70% of the HQLA. So the banks are not going to go and buy a lot of, you know, sovereign bonds, basically. But, you know, it will help the, the system. I just think the, the lending facility is far more powerful, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And coming back, I mean, on the stigma, you're right that, uh, you know, the, the good combination uh, between, as you said, the terms, uh, the maturity of the operation, the collateral, the pricing, uh, all of this, all of this matters, and it's not easy to to to, to get, calibrate exactly yeah. to get it right. I mean, another another dimension is, of course, how bank supervisors will look at you know the recourse or can, in my view, what would be persistent recourse to to central bank operations. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and this is also an adaptation that needs to take place because in certain cases uh, the stigma can also come from the way that supervisors look at that. Yeah, correct. Rather than markets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To, to that last point, I think there are three representative agents who have to be convinced that it's perfectly fine if you want to get rid of stigma. You need the supervisor, you need the CFO, and you need Arancha. Otherwise, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am the toughest one. You will have Arancha's yeah. numbers. So. On, on, on this point, Ivana, it's very interesting. Bank of England, they say clearly that there is no stigma associated to the usage of our lending facility in the new, in the new world. So, for example, this is an important indication not that contributed to reduce the stigma. Mm. Yeah. And maybe just on this point, the stigma, the thing is that if you ensure that there's no stigma going to the operation, that means that you are probably marginally too accommodative. Because if Possible. you want a bank like, sorry, for example, a big French bank, uh, to go to the financing operation, it has to be relatively accommodative because mm. this is the kind of bank that has a large access to the, to the market. So indeed, that's the issue, but that's obviously the issue you will face in the, in the future of viewing your, your monetary framework is how to adapt the monetary framework without having an impact on monetary stance. And that's probably the issue with the stigma. And obviously, the, the question will be by test and trial. What we know is that the first um, modalities of TLTR03 were not enough accommodative, not accommodative enough, because I think that at the September 2019, there was 3, 3, 3 billion euros of yeah. borrowing. Yeah. So not accommodative enough, clearly. It's clear that the, the last uh, modalities of TLTR03 were too accommodative. Mm. We can agree on that too. We agree on <laughs> Even that. Even if it's on my Christmas list, but... <laughs> okay. uh, no, absolutely. But, I mean, read the other dimension of um, these different um, instruments is that they distribute liquidity differently in the financial system, yeah? yeah. So basically, uh, when the central bank um, uh, conducts asset purchases, uh, it doesn't give rise to uh, the same, uh, you know, flows uh, across banks and then non-banks than when you do lending operations where you, you lend directly to banks. And so how do you see also um, the role of these uh, two different instruments from this perspective of redistribution of liquidity across the financial system. Yeah, I think that I, I will join uh, Arantxa saying that, again, 
Tieltiero, but I think you know that I'm a huge fan of Tieltiero, but I think that Tieltiero are more efficient. If you compare the, the QE, a purchase program, versus a long term of financing operation, purchase program inject overnight liquidity, whereas Tieltiero, or long term of financing operation, inject term funding for banks. So it's way more easy, it's way easier for banks to get long term of financing operation from the ECB so that you have term funding, you have no issue of uh, net stable uh, funding ratio. And so it's, the, this first part is more efficient than the simple QE, the simple purchase program. Of course, I know that uh, purchase program remove duration from the market so a bank can more easily issue covered bond or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So it's uh, kind of counter uh, the, the, the fact that it's not as efficient as CLTRO, but still, on this point of view, CLTRO are more efficient. Banks need term funding, banks have term funding from the ECB directly. So the second point, indeed, is that QE is a passive way of injecting liquidity. You buy stuff and then the liquidity goes to asset manager, to money market fund, and then they go to banks. But this means that naturally the liquidity will go to the safest banks. And if you look at the, the distribution of liquidity by jurisdiction after the QE, it's clear that the liquidity of the QE went first uh, and foremost to Germany, yeah. uh, France, and Netherlands. On the contrary, TLTRO are a proactive way of bank to ask for money, depending on the way they fund their them uh, elsewhere, by cover bond or whatever, and by their need for liquidity. And this is what you can see with especially the, the borrowing at TL Tiro 3, is that TL, TL Tiro 3 have increased mostly liquidity in Italy, Spain and Portugal, where the bank needed the most, because this is where the credit impulse was the most uh, needed. So that's why TL Tiro are a more efficient way to provide liquidity at the right time, all the, at the right place, all the more if we are in a system that stays in the financial fragmentation more or less. I mean, we are in a better situation than we were in 2012, obviously, but still, there's still this uh, shadow uh, financial fragmentation and the, the TLTRO are the best way to overcome uh, this, uh, this financial uh, shell fragmentation. Obvious, here again, uh, what we just discussed um, earlier, to um, calibrate the, the TLTRO to be accommodative enough for banks to go without stigma, but not too accommodative, otherwise you have an impact on your monetary stance. That's an issue that will have to be discussed. And the other question also is how to manage the collateral framework to ensure mm. that it is as efficient uh, to accompany the, the new um, framework of reference operation. Mm. No. no, I think the collateral, we didn't mention the collateral framework, that's Especially because, I mean, as I said, when you look at the balance sheet of the banks in the euro area, we haven't grown. I mean, for 10 years, we've been contracted balance sheet, you know? This is the question I asked to Philly Lane, because the, the only expansion of the loans that we had in the last three years is because they were government, you know, guarantees attached to those loans. But credit creation hasn't naturally happened over the last 10 years for a lot of reasons. Most of it is regulation, but also because, you know, the economy wasn't exactly. growing. So, so there's a combination of the two. But it's important to remember, because <coughs> if the collateral framework is too narrow, banks have not generated collateral. So by, by nature, you're going to exclude certain banks that have not been able to generate that collateral. So that's something important to consider. What kind of collateral framework you can, you can apply, basically? No, I, I agree. This is a crucial point, in my opinion, in the new operational framework the ECB was introduced. Scarce reserve or IP reserve, which means uh, aggregate usage of the ECB liquidity operations. And without eligible collateral, of course, banks do not have, do not have access. But when, uh, is in, for me, what is important, the collateral framework, I think the ECB should reduce the dependence on market volatility. It happens with the securities, uh, with market security, like government bonds. And also, it depends on uh, the assessment from rating agencies. So having a collateral framework based on, for example, on in-house credit assessment by central banks. We know yeah. that uh, ICAS, many central banks in the euro system, have very developed, made a lot of progress in this sense, in the, in the assessment of loans, provide, credit claims provided by banks. This is very important because banks would have a large part of their illiquid assets, like loans, eligible for ECB operations. And this will be a sort of a buffer of eligible collateral that can be used in case of mm. stress. Mm. stress yeah. And potentially could lead banks to reduce the amount of reserves because if I know that I can use my loans to the ECB Correct, yeah. to, for a, a, an emergency borrowing, 
basically, I can, I can be a bit slightly <laughs> more relaxed on, 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 on the reserves. And uh, at the moment, uh, we are still benefiting from the easing collateral measures during the pandemic on the ACC, on you know, the additional credit claims. Most of them are still with the uh, government guarantee. So for this season, the value in terms of borrowing capacity is still high. What will happen from March 2024 when uh, these measures will, uh, will end? So it's important now to consider at least part of this measure to con be continued, just to maintain this uh, a sizable amount of this uh, collateral eligible for uh, ECB borrowing. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, banks would <laughs> like to run on lower LCRs, you know? Yeah. It's not that they are dreaming on having very high LCRs. The problem is they cannot get away with the fear, you know, of having a shock yeah. and being with a lower and buffer. I think that uh, if uh, investors <laughs> knows that uh, <laughs> banks are using illiquid collateral for borrowing, probably this uh, reduce a bit the stigma. I don't yes. know. Yeah, that's possible. Because it's probably something that uh, is positive for the profitability of the bank because mm. you reduce the cost as a support. Yeah, yeah. And I think it also goes to this idea that you want um, to be able to provide reserves elastically Elastic. in case of stress. Absolutely. Okay? Exactly. So if you know that your collateral framework is broad enough to accommodate mm -hmm. this kind of you know, uh, increase in the size of uh, liquidity facilities in, in um, times of stress, this is obviously uh, uh, comfort element uh, for the market ex ante, yeah, yes. I would say. Uh, of course, you have another situation or possibility, which is just to uh, broaden your collateral um, eligibility when you have stress, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's another way to do it. But, but it's intimately, in yeah. my view, Maybe uh, linked. This already this buffer of collateral is absolutely good. But for it to be a substitute, I'll just get back to the point that was made earlier, for those facilities to be a, a substitute for ex ante holding buffers of cash? Yes there has to be no stigma, or there has to be the belief that it's going to be worthwhile doing it, and that involves those three people I was talking about, the supervisor, the CFO, and Arancha. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. So we're coming to the end of the panel, but before we close, I wanted to ask uh, one uh, last provocative question to you, which is actually inspired by um, an article that Louis, you, um, you, you, you wrote, uh, so you're the culprit here. Um, <laughs> And um, so you, you actually um, had a piece about how to marry condo the operational framework. So how to simplify the operational framework to its essential elements. Uh, and so uh, my challenge for you today is in one minute, for every one of you, how would you go about uh, Marie Kondo the operational framework? And maybe we start with the inventor of the, of the quote, yeah. Sir so Louis. <laughs> yeah, I think my paper was totally non-conclusive. <laughs> it was a 25 paper. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, my, my answer, my simple answer is just get rid of all asset purchase program. I mean, it's not, it doesn't bring joy, as Marie Kondo would say. So it doesn't bring joy, though it, it has to get uh, out. So you don't use any more purchase program except for French asset and you replace them by refinancing operation, very long term refinancing operation, whatever it is, with the right calibration, with the duration of the operation and the, the rate, I would say, say three years at say, deposit plus 10 or something like that, and adapting uh, depending on bank's need for, for liquidity. Quite radical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, for me, uh, one important one thing um, I think get to let the to get rid of is uh, the three months HRO. In my opinion, make no sense. Three months, three months operation. It's similar to the one week. Excellent. If you want to have a, mm. uh, because it's not good for the stable funding ratio, it's the same value for the liquidity cover ratio as mm. the MRO, has, there's no impact uh, on the, in terms of over and off. While it's much more important to have a long-term refinance operation, maybe more than one year, or six, between six months and one year, they still have some unstable funding ratio value. And what uh, I, ca I, ca I would keep absolutely is uh, the full allotment, even in the world of uh, yeah. scarce reserve, mm -hmm. not come back to an auction system. Full allotment <laughs> is important because the market is uh, sure that there will be no liquidity shock, no liquidity crisis. Banks uh, can, can tap the ECB without any problem, provided that they have, of course, eligible collateral. Yeah, so you satisfy fully the, yes, the fully. needs expressed yes. by banks. It's like, yeah. for example, they work very well, they swap uh, the um, dollar swap line facility. Yeah. No? For many weeks, uh, there was no usage, but the fact that the swap line is there, uh, market is, uh, is, uh, is uh, confident that there will be no shock 
mm. in the dollar market. Yeah, so yeah. provide confidence. Exactly, provide confidence. So commitment. Commitment and confidence in the market, which is crucial, especially in a period of stress. Yeah, um, I think at least in the design process, I would probably get rid of the <clears throat> in obsession or infatuation that I think lots of folks in the central banking world have with the design process for utter and complete control of short-term interest rates where you get, you know, at most one basis point of variation yep. from one day to the next. I think that kind of extraordinary focus is unnecessary. I did some work with a former colleague from the Fed years ago about volatility and overnight rates and how far out the curve it transmits. And the answer is maybe six months out the curve, not something. And so in terms of doing the macro policy implementation that a central bank really cares about for full employment or inflationary control, that kind of variation, I think, is not as important. And so one could spend enormous energy wringing out the last little bit of volatility in overnight markets without necessarily achieving much in the way of benefit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that rings a bell from the pre-crisis <laughs> period, I think, for some of us. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm not a markets person, so, but I would say my Christmas list is be simple, be predictable, don't move me the goalposts, please, you know, because then I don't know where to stand. And yes, financial operation with some tenor, full allotment, and no extremely penal cost is basically what it needs for me to know that in stress scenarios, the backup is there, you know? Yeah. Because I, otherwise I will always barbell the banks, you know? The high quality ones, the one that has very high operating profits, high RE, and I will always be worried by the tail, basically. No, absolutely. No, thanks a lot. So now we're going to turn uh, to the audience, uh, both virtually and also here in the room, uh, for questions. And we have approximately uh, 13 minutes for questions. So we have ample time to take, uh, I would say, at least three questions. Yes, there's one over there. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks to the panelists and to <laughs> I cannot. Maybe you want to introduce yourself yeah, yeah. as well. So Cyril Manet from the University of Bern, so thanks to the panelists, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I have one question in my mind which is related to CBDC. So the um, uh, ECB might go forward with the digital euro and I was wondering uh, what would bring joy to uh, banks treasurers? No. <laughs> Not that one, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Okay. I don't have a strong views, but it's... Uh, uh, first of all, tomorrow we have a nice session on that, so I'm looking forward yeah. to listen. We will be inside yes. <laughs> talking to that. No, in my opinion, it depends a lot. Of, very quick answer. It depends, of course, this, uh, there is a risk that this could create some uh, shift of deposits from retail to the central bank. I think the central banks are fully aware of this, uh, of this aspect, and I'm sure that they will take the in consideration in the design of the, of, the, of the operation on how to put in some limits to the amount of uh, CDBC that can be account or, yeah, or provide some uh, instrument to <coughs> banks uh, to replace this and that. So I would wait to tomorrow maybe to have more color yeah, on that. more color on that, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, there's one over there. Yeah, uh, thank you for a very interesting panel. I'm Shadan from uh, Reserve Bank of India. Uh, so when you talk about uh, risk management philosophy, so there we have known knowns, which is basically are that all that RW and everything. Then we have known unknowns, which you know after financial crisis we have delved into that how fat the tail is and everything and all that. But the reason I'm asking this because we have covered how exactly that banks are being over cautious. And mm. uh, Seth has pointed out that Oops. right now we are operating in the realm of unknown unknowns. The crisis that we used to have once in a lifetime, it's happening every one or two years, yeah. practically. So if we talk about risk management philosophy of the bank, what exactly is the path ahead for them? How exactly they can opt or to survive in this environment? Obviously, one thing which you have touched upon is that the final backstop of a central bank. But you, as we know, there is obviously moral hazard and other complication with that. So I just want to know your thoughts on exactly that the kind of world that it is becoming, 
how exactly can ba bank top to survive without being you know overly cautious that's all thank you Wow. Uh, <coughs> so, Which is also a question about, you know, this kind of balance between banks' self-insurance, yeah. okay, yeah. and then the insurance that is provided by central banks. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, I'm willing to say that banks are cautious. I don't know if they're overly cautious. That's sort of a judgment for lots of people who do things other than write economics research papers. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I think the, the crux to the, of my answer to the question is, uh, it's going to take time. It's an evolutionary process. When I think about people making investments or I think about risk officers at banks, they're looking at inflows, they're looking at outflows, they're trying to think about correlations across variables. But you've got a sample period. And um, one thing that I tell general macro investors <coughs> when they're trying to think about correlations of assets and where they could go is extend your sample period beyond the past 25 years. I think we're the topics we're talking about are ones where the relevant period is really a fairly short period of time, and the only way to get a longer sample period is to just wait and see what happens. And I think therein lies a big part of the, the caution uh, from, from risk managers is they don't know what they don't know, and they're trying to, to learn as they're going. I mean, you've seen it on deposit betas, you know, on how people think about modeling those betas, you know. Um, I mean, as Iman said, you know, digital banks, digital connectivity means um, the models that you had in the past probably are not perfect, you know, are basically going to be outdated. So by definition, <coughs> you're going to need to think that, you know, as we saw in the U.S., there was a rate at which, basically, banks didn't pay up the po for deposits. And guess what happened? There is an, a shock into the system, and suddenly, you know, the deposit beta is incrementally close to 80 90%. So for those reasons, first of all, the accuracy of the data models, so you're going to need to request from the banks to know better their customer bases, yeah. which is very important. And whoever fails on that is going to be systemic for a risk, you know. But I think that's the first premise. Know your customer base and segment your customer base as as much as you can so that you can predict better, you know, the future. Because if you're just using the old models, you're probably going to get it wrong, basically. No. Uh, very quick, my, I think that uh, banks will maintain a cautious approach, less risk tolerance, and they will continue. And uh, this, in my opinion, I see implication on the market functioning because in a period of stress, they will further reduce the presence in the market in the intermediation, just because they don't want to take risk from, yeah. the, from the market. And so the just, we need to watch banks, but also the role of banks in the financial markets in terms of intermediation roles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it, it's also a bit paradoxical that if every bank remains very cautious w when faced with a shock, okay, mm -hmm. collectively, uh, this may actually be a problem yes, yes. because Which is, nobody is willing to step in <laughs> exactly. and, and kind of, uh, you know, arbitrage and make markets uh, yeah. in these conditions. Yeah. There will be always a bank. I mean, we saw it in the U.S. You know, J.P. Morgan always will step up for a spread. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, for a spread. There is one that always goes there. You know, but again, you need more than just it's J.P. Morgan. More than one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yes, we have to be prepared for that, I would say, you know. And, and, you know, there's enough institutions in Europe that are okay, you know, so, but they need to have this full comfort zone that if they step in, you know, like they did in COVID, you know, it's not everything yeah. bad, you know. In COVID, there's a, you know, the group of strong banks that came in to lend, to, to be in the market, you know, so, so I don't think it's all terrible, basically. Yeah, but COVID was, was easy, quote unquote, because that was a symmetric shock. Absolutely. And, you know, you had this kind of market wide, uh, all the market was affected, and, and basically this is why you had this reaction. Yeah. I think you can have, you know, in other situations, like we've seen with Credit Suisse and the aftermath, you can have things that, you know, seem idiosyncratic. Uh, it's much more difficult, uh, in my view, to put back on track, yeah. The other thing is I think we participants, you know, central banks, investors, we need to do a better effort to explain the, to, to all the stakeholders what is the connectivity of the different actions, yeah. you know. And by that, for example, I'm just thinking the 
you know, idiosyncratic sort of taxes that they put on banks, you know, in different countries. So, you know, all these factors affect the reaction function, you know, of the system. So I guess it, it, it's our job also to try to explain, you know, the connectivity of events, you know, just to prevent kind of that situation where we all freak out and then there is, there is no one stepping in to help the system. Just if I may add on the, on the question of bank being overly cautious, I think that we are in a, in a industry that favors the fact to be overly cautious. I mean, we have a competitive advantage as a bank if we are overly cautious because we fund ourselves at better conditions and consequently we are able to provide loans or liquidity at better conditions. So it's also, I mean, it's not only the fact that we are scared, we, I mean, uh, as a banker, we are scared by potential uncertainties. It's also because being a very safe bank, it's better to do a daily business. Mm. And so that will be, in my view, even more the case in the future as due to the reduction of uh, long term of financing operation and the reduction of overall liquidity in the system will have more competition within the Eurozone banking system. I mean, the competition is more or less dead with TLT Euro 2. And now we are back with repayment of TLT Euro 3. We are back to uh, competition in terms of funding and consequently in terms of ability to provide a good price to our customers. So you, there's also this incentive for banks to be overly, overly cautious. Yeah. I'm looking if we have other questions. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. On the being cautious uh, issue, I mean, you can be cautious by uh, hoarding liquidity, by uh, thinking of uh, safer loans or other parts of your balance sheet. You can also be uh, cautious by building up your equity capital. Uh, and uh, we haven't talked about that, uh, but maybe you want to say something on, on that being a stronger, uh, more solvent uh, institution that can withstand uh, shocks and maybe even sort of, uh, sort of uh, being a recipient of uh, uh, people <coughs> running out of weaker banks. Yeah, I can talk about that. I mean, uh, it's been a race for the, I mean, sometimes it makes me laugh in regulation because they say, well, this is a temporary higher requirement buffer, but, you know, the buffer is there to be, you know, run down in time of stress. I never said that, never you know. <laughs> Whenever there's a capital requirement, it's there to stay, you know. I mean, it's never run down. So I agree with you. We investors perceive higher capital ratios as a reason, you know, of safety you know, basically strength, you know. Now, if you have too much excess equity, your returns are lower. And that's when we demand share buybacks. We demand part of that capital to be returned. So, so it's, it's a fine line between running with your optimal capital, which doesn't allow you to redistribute properly investors, to running with too much excess capital that you don't distribute because then you dilute your returns, you know. And I think the banks have got much better on that. And I think the regulator, Andrea, has done a, a, a fantastic job on that. So that's why it probably has come out less in the conversation than liquidity. Yeah, liquidity. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's, there's a question online uh, from Ravi Venda. Will market participants rationally choose to write more tail risk as a result of central bank full allotment facilities at non-penalized rates. Uh, won't that increase systemic risk in the long run? I don't think that the full allotment uh, is an incentive for banks to take more risk uh, no. because they have uh, RWA, for example, Correct, that, uh, yeah. is, uh, is a strong constraint for banks uh, yeah. to not to take uh, non-necessary non risk, I would say. Yeah. So full allotment, I see full allotment as a, just as a backstop. You a, mm. inject yeah. the confidence in the market that there will be no liquidity problem. Also, for allotments is a nice word, but if you don't have a reachable collateral, you can borrow. And you don't want to show to the market that you are borrowing one trillion at the MRO. Yes. In the sense that <laughs> so there are basically, for allotments is there, but there are many other aspects mm. that the banks will consider. So, to be honest, I don't see any strong any relationship between full allotment and, and uh, risk. Mm -hmm. Agreed. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so specifically full allotment to, to those systemic risks, probably not. I did say earlier that 
<clears throat> so before September 19th, I remember like the Thursday before I had clients seeing what was going on in financial markets and then called me and said, so how much more stress does it take before the Fed steps in to intervene? So maybe the connection is not with full alignment per se, but I do believe there is there is still some moral hazard that exists with the amount of inter with the, the types of interventions that we've seen. Maybe if I want to add one point, for example, TFTRO3 during the pandemic is a, a great example because uh, banks had the opportunity to borrow at very generous conditions so using easing collateral measures, a full allotment, but they did increase the risk also because a large part of the loans they provided were, were with the government guaranteed, as we discussed before. So this is an example that banks are cautious on taking risk. When, uh, yeah, but what, what said is said is interesting. I was just thinking to myself, basically, what happened with the regional banks, you know? Um, I mean, the system was relatively safe with the large ones. And on top of that, they were gaining the deposits from the regional banks. Now, you know, the Fed came with a very, very generous, you know, solution for making sure the regional banks are there. So I guess the market participants, I don't know if the question was coming that way, is how to calibrate, mm. you know, not only the timing, but the extent of how far do you want to reach, you know? Um, do you want to, you know, just, just bail out everyone? Do you want to basically, you know, create some moral hazard mm. so that, you know, wrong, in, you know, wrong ways of working in the market get addressed? And, and I think it's that calibration which is important. That's challenging. Yeah, of course, in this sense, yes, with uh, mm. all the facility and uh, the yep. creative. There's one over there. Risk is, the, the big message of this panel has been the very risky behavior of banks toward, or very risk averse behavior, very cautious behavior of banks towards risk. Can I ask you to elaborate though on a distinction and a margin? There's liquidity risk and there is credit risk. When it comes to liquidity risk, I understand why you call on the central bank to essentially satisfy the desire for caution by eliminating it. After yeah. all, that is the job of the central bank. When it comes to credit risk though, I don't want the central bank to hold any credit risk at all. If the banks are overtly risky, risk averse, then I want a non-bank sector to emerge, take on that risk, and that's where the substitution should happen in between the market. The two kinds of risk have been a little mixed up in the panel, naturally, as part of the discussion. And I worry that some of your proposals for getting rid of your liquidity risk is dumping credit risk on the central bank. And I worry that the non-bank sector hasn't been mentioned at all, which should be the valve for the risk aversion, excessive or not, of banks to, uh, for that risk to channel somewhat, and which we somewhat don't see in Europe. So could you make that distinction well, and across those two margins? That's an excellent question, because in the US, the bank channel is what, 20, 30% of the total system. The regulation is narrow down the scope of the things that the bank <laughs> can do, that all the credit excess, and this good credit mm. access and bad credit mm. access is basically in the non-bank channel. Now, question mark on the transmission mechanism or things like, you know, rates, basically. I mean, see how long it's taking, you know, for things to show up in the economy. Um, in Europe, banks are 70% of the credit transformation. So until you create a second system, you know, which is the non-bank channel, what you're going to have is the cycles are going to be very short. So, so why the, the pass-through of interest rates in, in the euro area has created very quickly, you know, those effects in the economy? Because it's, the bank channel is, is the majority of the credit creation. So, but you're right. We need to develop a, a second system that can channel the excess credit that the banks today cannot have. I mean, the, the banks today is very clear. They can only lend to very healthy households and corporates. And the minute that these healthy households and corporates potentially turn less good, they start tightening because it's, it's just hit the ratios very quickly. Yeah. I think one other part that's sort of funny about money markets <coughs> is secured versus unsecured markets. Um, and in secured markets, there are lots of different ways of managing different types of risks. So you could have the, the rate that the, that the loan is made, the repo is made, You've got the haircut on it, which also limits credit risk. And then on top of that, in money markets, you have line limits. And all three happen simultaneously, which makes in my, one of the reasons why I've always thought the repo market was a more interesting market than just about any market 
in the world because it's over-identified from, from to, to use econometric speak. Uh, different frequent, you know, different ones of those three margins get adjusted with different frequency, but I think you've got all of those. And the challenge, though, is the line limit part of it is really important. In general, profitability of lending in money, secured money markets is pretty low. And so the first reaction, since you're not making that much margin, is to pull back in overall lending regardless of whether it's liquidity risk or credit risk, very often those sorts of decisions at the trading desk level are, are too fine a distinction. We have one question over there. Many thanks, very interesting. I'm following up a bit on your question. I wanted to ask, I mean, when you think about the operational framework, how you want to reframe it, it's not a starting point thinking about also, now we have a big transformation, we have climate risk, we have geopolitical risk, the whole, um, um, economy is, 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 is um, changing. Is it best finance this transformation via the capital market or via the banks? And that, in a way, will also frame to some extent. Yeah, what you do? You need a long-term refinancing operation, or can you come up with something different? So, mm -hmm. I think the starting point must be in all of that a bit more the transformation we are going through. I haven't heard much um, yeah. today. Maybe. Um, yeah, I have something else. Yeah, I think that we have decided proactively to set aside the, the financial stability part mm. uh, of the monetary, of the, that's not monetary policy, that's financial stability. So indeed, I mean, we have not discussed the, the question of purchase program as financial stability. And I see that Philippe Lane talked this morning about the fact that the PPP was very specific because it was both a monetary policy framework, injecting liquidity, monetary policy easing, removing duration and also financial stability compressing spread so that's indeed something we have uh, we have not discussed at all i think that it could be and that, that's my my provocative view on the fact that the ecb should uh, get rid of purchase program because the fact that purchase program merge three different aspects makes that they are, they are often less efficient in my view uh, than refinancing operation and so, indeed, I'm totally uh, supporting the fact that the ECB should remain the, uh, should continue fighting um, uh, fragmentation. So, we definitely need potential purchase program to ensure that you don't have too much uh, sovereign spread because we all know that it's an impact on the monetary policy and on the monetary framework. So clearly, we need uh, to have the, the, the most powerful institution in the European Union to remain here to ensure that the, the tail risk the world is facing will not, uh, will not have an impact on the way its monetary policy is transmitted. So, I mean, I totally agree with you on that. And also implicitly, that's the other tail risk we are facing is the fact that the... the so, I mean, the climate change, we have not discussed that either, but that's also a point that will have to be taken into account the new monetary framework and probably the new collateral framework. So, that's also part, but indeed, we have focused more on, on, um, on the, the, the monetary framework, and that's why we have, we have set the, that, that aside. Regarding the, the, the need for banks for term funding, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, an absolute need because we can make ourselves uh, the transformation. It's just that you have, you have, in my view, stronger impact by lending over the, the long term. And you, I mean, if you want banks to borrow overnight at the ECB, you have to make a rate that is very favorable, probably below the deposit, below the deposit rate, otherwise you have a stigma impact. If you want to provide banks to a rate that is not too low, you have to provide them term funding, otherwise they would not be interested in coming borrowing. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's the point about the fact that each bank will not come and borrow liquidity, so you have a decrease of liquidity, and consequently the system as a whole will be weakened by the fact that whole banks will not be interested by, uh, by borrowing. So you have to make borrowing to the ECB interesting enough. And so as you don't play too much with the rate, even as the deposit rate, I'm sure that you would have a lot of banks that would borrow, you have to play with, uh, with the duration in my view of operation. <clears throat> yes, just to add a few comments on that, uh, we need to consider that uh, all the changes we mentioned at the beginning on that have occurred over the past 10 years uh, is important. Now, the, the concept of liquidity mm. of funding for banks has changed. It's not anymore overnight funding or <coughs> short-term funding as it was uh, before the crisis. Now it's long-term funding. And in this sense, uh, a long-term financial operation, uh, liquidity operation I mentioned before was, uh, was important because this is now, the real value of liquidity is uh, long-term liquidity. Yeah. Uh, banks uh, could uh, support uh, 
lending also if they have a long term liquidity, if you are sure that they can have a stable long term, non stable funding. And which is also the important unstable funding ratio that is now is not under focus because it's not the immediate liquidity, liquidity needs, but it's important for banks to have stable funding. And in this, that we have a collateral framework to, to make more close banks to the lending because if you can bring your loans to the central banks, basically you have an incentive to, to lend to your economy as was the case during, during, the, during, the, during the COVID. And also, there are many other aspects that we need to consider related to the bank's balance sheet, the use of bank balance sheet. And so this is important to know their risk tolerance that has to be considered. Banks have to adapt to this new, new environment. No, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, and I think it's true that, you know, uh, the changes in financial intermediation in yeah. the financing needs of the economy is something also that is having an impact on the way we, we think about um, our um, operations, yeah, and our range of operations. So thanks a lot to all my panelists. I think we have gathered uh, a wealth of very uh, valuable insights uh, throughout our discussion, frankly. And uh, it remains clear that, you know, uh, designing and uh, maintaining central bank operational frameworks uh, is a very daunting and challenging task, uh, especially now. And that, uh, in my view, I mean, some degree of, of trial and, and error will likely be needed, you know, as we adapt uh, to, to the new normal. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, uh, needless to say, I think it's very important to have you, so basically banks, markets, investors, because you will also have to adapt uh, to this new normal. And I think it's this adaptation uh, which happens on both sides, on the side of the central bank, uh, adapting its, its framework, its toolkit, and your adaptation that will make the thing successful. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, I think this closes um, today's uh, discussions. And thanks very much also uh, for attending.